today I thought I'd be preaching to you from a local wood uh, just to add a bit of different scenery uh, for you. Um, we have some exciting things in store. Uh, I have a couple of people in the church who are going to be also uh, sharing some great little testimonies uh, for you. So uh, that's going to be something to look forward to. Uh, last week, if you remember, we were looking at Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came mightily on a, the 120 that were in the upper room. And uh, what we saw was straight away, Peter went out, started preaching to the crowd that was very kind of a mixed group of people from different regions. And we saw over 3,000 people uh, getting saved. Uh, today, we are going to be looking at uh, another progression of the gospel uh, with the Holy Spirit coming mightily on one particular man, Philip. Uh, and uh, we're going to be seeing what happens for him as he goes and he starts preaching to a different area, the Samaritans. Um, so it's going to be very exciting. Um, let's remember just a little bit that uh, Acts was uh, written by Luke, okay, and uh, he wasn't sending this to a, a, another church, uh, sort of like many of the epistles were, but he was actually writing it to, uh, we're told, to Theophilus. Uh, we're not quite sure who Theophilus was. Uh, some think that he could have been Paul's lawyer uh, when Paul was kind of facing trial in Rome. So he was kind of writing it, kind of explaining what happened both in his own gospel of Luke, but then later on to the, how the early church then started reaching some of these unreached areas. And um, we uh, pick it up uh, in chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, I'm going to just read a few of these verses for you, if you follow me. Um, just the background we have just had in chapter 7. We've just had Stephen um, getting stoned to death. Um, and so we're just coming out of that, and, it, and Luke starts like this. It's all approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Let's um, first of all just look at Paul or as he was called then, Saul. Um, it's quite interesting what Luke includes here about him. Um, it says, very markedly, it says, godly men buried Stephen and were kind of grieved. But it then says of, of Saul that he began to destroy the church. What we see at this point is that Saul was probably the, one of the church's greatest persecutors. He was going from house to house, we're told here, uh, basically finding men and women who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was throwing them in prison. It's only later on that we see, actually in the next chapter, chapter 9, that we see that he's going down the road, and suddenly he's encountered by the risen Christ who confronts him and says to him, you actually, you're against me. I think here we've got a situation where uh, Saul thought in his own heart, he thought 
He was acting for God. He was stamping out this completely heretical sect as he's seen it that was destroying Judaism and, and all that it stood for. It was taking people away from the temple and it was focusing on this upstart. The fact was, he was completely wrong. <laughs> he, he, he thought he was doing God's will, but he was completely wrong. And it was only as he, conf as he was confronted by the risen Christ that actually he sees that he's been batting, as it were, on the wrong side. Um, I love this phrase that Paul later talks about in um, 1 Timothy 1.16. It says, But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Maybe you're here today and you're listening to this um, on our YouTube live channel and you might be completely against Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's good news <laughs> because just like <laughs> Saul, God can turn you 180 degrees around and actually get you facing the other way. Uh, there is a point where we need to be able to have a humility that says, actually, I got it completely wrong. I thought I was right. I'm completely wrong. And for goodness sake in your life, don't keep just going in the same direction. Have the humility to be able to turn around like Paul and, and Paul was used mightily by God to bringing hundreds, thousands of people to Christ, and God used him mightily. So there's, there's good news if that's you today. Maybe you feel that, you know what, I'm just the worst of sinners. If you knew my life, you would know that I was, I'm hopeless. Well, that's what Paul said about himself. I was the worst of sinners, and yet, and I just love this phrase, and yet, I, I know that God has mercy for me and he has immense patience. Next we come to Philip. Let's just look at him. Uh, what an amazing man of faith. Now, remember, he wasn't one of the 12, but he, we do see him as one of the 120 that got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the upper room. He was also in Acts 6, uh, one of the seven that was chosen by the apostles uh, to do the, the social action program uh, with some of the widows uh, so that they could focus their time uh, on preaching the word and prayer. Uh, so we see him in this and um, he's a man who's, he, uh, he could have lain low. I mean, one of those seven was Stephen. Um, and he had just been killed, so now there was only six. Um, and what we see about Philip is that instead of kind of thinking, I'm just going to kind of hold back for a few months, um, <clears throat> go into lockdown and just wait and see what happens. No, he launches himself out uh, into this new area, uh, which we call Samaria. And he started to just preach the word but not just preaching, he came with signs and we see uh, demonic spirits uh, coming out of people. We see the lame walking, the paralyzed. We see a mighty acts of God. I just want to say, I am believing as a church that uh, for you and I, isn't it amazing what one man can do? One man brought about this radical change where they saw hundreds of people coming to faith in this new area. Let's believe God for more acts of power. Why don't you ask God to say, Lord, help me to be someone who brings, not just preaches the word of God, but also demonstrates the word of God in terms of acts of healing. We're gonna hear now uh, from uh, Maureen, uh, one of our church who, recently just prayed for her mum. 
About three weeks ago, my mum had a massive spasm from on her lower part of her body. This was triggered by nerve pain in her lower back and right hip area. And it also restricted her movement. She found it very difficult to walk, very painful to sit down, and she actually couldn't lie down to sleep at night. This went on for a couple of days and I phoned her over FaceTime and I could see the tension and the pain on her face. She was crying and all she could say to me was, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. I said, oh, mum, I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to come and for Jesus to heal you now. So I put my hand over the phone as if uh, over her head and invited Holy Spirit to come in power and also commanded in the name of Jesus for all the pain to go and for her body to come into God's uh, perfect alignment for her. And then for another minute or so, I continued to invite Holy Spirit to keep coming in his power and to release the peace of God to my mother. And I was watching and her countenance, her, her face changed. I could see the pain and the tension go and the peace of God come. And I really sensed the compassion of God for my mum at this time too. And then she started to say, oh, it's going, it's going. And then it was gone and she was free of pain and she was free to move around. And it was a wonderful moment. And she's not had any problems in that area since. Praise God. In Acts 1.8, if we remember, Jesus, in his kind of parting words to the disciples, he says this. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it's interesting, this progression, and I think it's interesting for us. So he's actually giving them a plan of actually reaching different areas. First of all, reach the capital city, reach Jerusalem. They're, they're the same as you, they speak the same as you, their customs are the same as you. And in many ways, as a church, that's what we've done by reaching Edinburgh as the capital city, first of all. And then there's Judea. What's the difference between Judea and the, the capital city? of Jerusalem? Well, the difference is it's a little bit more kind of out in the boonies. There, there's a difference in terms of, there are maybe not all city folk. Um, there's different kinds of jobs that they will do. There's different kinds of economy that they'll have. There's different kinds of houses. Um, so what's our Judea? Well, I think our Judea is the Lothians. Um, that's the next area and uh, obviously that's what we have started to do as a church. We've planted a church into West Lothian and let's believe God that there'll be other church plants into other parts of the Lothians as well. And uh, I know that they find that there are just there are just little nuances, little differences in terms of reaching people that I think we just need to be aware of. But I want, this is the challenge I want to bring uh, this morning is that then Jesus is saying, go to Samaria. Is Samaria before the ends of the world? It's not that we shouldn't go to the ends of the world, but it's actually, there are some lessons we can learn by going to Samaria. What's Samaria? Well, actually, it looks like um, in Samaria, they were speaking Hebrew, whereas the, the Jews were actually speaking Aramaic. So there was a, there was a difference in that. And they... They obviously had different history and different customs and um, they were having to reach some of those things but they weren't Gentiles uh, clearly they weren't treated as Gentiles and they uh, th so there was some sort of commonality about it and I think we need to be thinking what is our Samaria what is the next area that actually God wants us to plant churches in what is it that actually uh, I could be reaching into and maybe that is going um, across into Europe, um, maybe Ireland, uh, some other areas where actually, okay, I've got to learn another language, but in many ways, there's a lot of things that are similar to us and a lot of, uh, a lot of things that I can actually connect with people in the same way. I thought it'd be helpful to actually have this just quick little interview with Valdario. Valdario uh, is from Brazil. He's part of our church. Um, he's doing a PhD here um, in Edinburgh. And uh, just to share some of his thoughts about some of the, 
the things that he's found as somebody from another country kind of learning about in Edinburgh. Valderio, tell me, what was the biggest cultural difference you found when moving from Brazil to Edinburgh? Well, I would say that there's a lot of um, things, but one definitely is physical contact. So uh, we Brazilian, we touch each other all the time. We are handshaking, kissing both cheeks and hugging and, and backs slaps. So it's very common during conversations we are touching um, just to get attention. And uh, this closeness like inspires some kind of trust, you know. So uh, um, and there's not this thing of a personal space so we don't care about this. If you are my friend, your personal space is my personal space as well. Um, and so you, you say you would even like touch someone's cheeks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes if, even you are playing with the other, so you can just play with his uh, hair and things like this. It's not, it's not like offensive for us these kind of things. Yeah, I don't think you could get away with that in, uh, in Scotland. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely not. <laughs> what else have you found that's different? Well, I, I think the, the, the social interactions, the, the dynamic of social, social interactions and how you make friends and you build up friendships is totally different in Brazil. So we are very informal and you make things very personal. Um, um, we quickly go for very intimate thoughts like um, talk about families, your, your past, and you know, I, I can just go in and ask you very personal questions. We never stay in the surface of small talks. And uh, we just, we, we don't just talk with words, we, we also talk with emotions, you know, so all the time we're trying to express emotions, mm. we stare at each, each other and eye contact is very important for us. You were and, telling me that friendships in Brazil were just much more spontaneous anyway. Yes, yes, yes. It goes naturally. And uh, it, it's not uncommon that you, you become close friend of someone that you have just met, you know, and you start right for your place and, and start doing a lot of things together. As I said before, often dividing one community from another community, even building a wall between it, uh, is man's sometimes best solution of sorting out what could be just conflict otherwise and um, the great news is that God has a different solution there's a lot of conflict around the world right now God has a different solution and we see this different solution here in Acts and we see that his solution is actually preaching the gospel bringing the power of God to work actually bringing different races, different people groups, um, different nationalities, all under one new man in Christ. That is God's solution that he brings, which is just an amazing, an amazing thing. Um, and what we see is that Peter and John were sent down by the brothers in Jerusalem to kind of check out this new move uh, that had happened. and. It's important to see they don't undo what Philip had laid. They don't undo that foundation. They look at it. Uh, people had been um, come to faith. They'd then been baptized in water. And I want to say to you, if you know Jesus Christ but haven't been baptized in water, just follow what God's saying here and say, when can I get baptized in water? That was the next thing. That's the next thing in our maturity is to say, I want to get baptized in water. And then, but what? The apostles brought is they said okay have you been filled with the holy spirit no we haven't okay you know jesus you've been baptized in water you need to be filled with the holy spirit so they laid hands on them and immediately those believers in samaria were filled with the holy spirit i want to leave you with four things that i think we can apply into our lives from this chapter the first thing is that we see that it is possible to know Jesus Christ, to be baptized in water, and yet not be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we see from this chapter. And again, I just want to say to you, if you're listening today, and that is you, and you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet, then don't miss out. Ask a friend or a small group leader and say, please pray for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Secondly, I want to say it can provokes us as a church to be thinking, what is our Samaria? God wants us to, it's great what we've done in terms of the church plant, in terms of West Lothian, in terms of what we are as a church into Edinburgh, but God wants to see us go further than that. And uh, I believe that um, he, is, he, he wants to stir that faith in us to say, come on, think about where your Samaria is. Thirdly, um, I think that God can use us to share the gospel with lots of different people groups. Sometimes people who speak different language to us, sometimes people who have different customs to us. God's answer isn't to, do, isn't to build a wall, it's to break down the wall and actually to reach across and to connect and to bring them into the family of God. And fourthly, let's believe God that as a church and as individuals, we'll be people who are, who are readily looking to pray for the sick and to see mighty miracles of God, just like we heard from Maureen. God bless you. Thank you again. Uh, have a safe and good week.